नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय शरीर पुषा मोहज पृथग भौतिक ईयते गृह यथोदाय पार्थिवा थाइजसायर जना कालेना झाथो विकृतो विनाश्यति इदं शरीरं पुरुषस्य मोहजं यथा पृथक् बोहितं ईयते गृहं यथाउदखाय पार्थिवथाय जसाय जना काले न जाथो विकृतो विनश्यति इदं शरीरं पुरुषस्य मोहजं यथा पृथक् भौतिक ईयते गृहं यथाउदखाय पार्थिवथाय जसर्जना काले न जाथो विकृतो विनश्यति इदं शरीरं पुरुषस्य मोहजं यथा पृथक् भौतिक ईयते गृहं यथाउदखाय पार्थिवथाय जसर्जना काले न जाथो विकृतो विनश्यति Just as a householder <coughs> just as a householder all different although different from the identity of his house thinks his house to be identical with him so the conditioned soul <coughs> due to ignorance accepts the body to be himself although the body is actually different from the soul This body is obtained through a combination of portions of earth, water and fire. And when the earth, water and fire are transformed in course of time, the body is vanquished. The soul has nothing to do with this creation and dissolution of the body. Purport by his divine grace. ऐसे भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी प्रभुपाद We transmigrate from one body to another in bodies that are products of our illusion but as spirit souls we always exist separately from material conditional life The example given here in is that a house or a car is always different from its owner but because of attachment that conditioned soul thinks it to be identical 
with him. A car or house is actually made of material elements. As long as the material elements combine together properly, the car or house exists. And when they are disassembled, the house or the car is disassembled. The spirit soul, however, always remains as he is. Om Akyantimidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshuru Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tatatishwa Padantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Jutha Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sakrajataham Sahakana Ragunatham Bitham Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadudam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Bitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu <coughs> Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Aptakanshana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Rananami Hari Priye Vansha Kalpatarubhyascha <coughs> Kripasindubhya Evacha Patitanan Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gauda Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Hare Just as a householder, although different from the identity of his house, thinks his house to be identical with him. As the conditioned soul, due to ignorance, accepts the body to be himself, although the body is actually different from the soul. The body is obtained through a combination of portions of earth, water, and fire. And when the earth, water, and fire are transformed in the course of time, the body is vanquished. The soul has nothing to do with this creation and dissolution of the body. Today, we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 2, entitled Hiranyakashipu, King of the Demons, Text 42. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna analyzes material nature from his perspective as the creator. Bumir aponalo vayu kamano buddha evacha ahankara iti ame bina prakriti That there are eight essential material elements. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. And there are three subtle material elements. The mind, intelligence, and the ego, ahankar. At the beginning of the cosmic manifestation, 
the Lord creates the Mahatattva. Therein he invests in a stagnant form the 25 material elements, which include these eight elements of material nature. And then the three modes of material nature. Because everything is stagnant. There's no dynamics. Then the Lord, he enters into the cosmic manifestation in the form of time, kala. Time energia, energizes and activates the three gunas, sattva guna, raja guna, tama guna. From that activation, the three modes of material nature put all the various elements into a flow of activity. And the Lord also, through his glance, impregnates the cosmic manifestation with innumerable jivatmas, or spirit souls. And according to the desires, the inclinations, and the activities of those jivatmas in previous lives, they are covered with bodies according to the to the corresponding three modes of material nature. But Krishna tells in the next verse in Gita, Apareyami Tashtvanyam Prakriti Indri Mepal Jiva Bhuta Mahabaho Yayedam Dharayate Jagat That besides this inferior external energy of mine, there is the superior spiritual nature which is the soul. The soul that is the source of life in everything. Later on, Krishna explains the constitutional nature of the soul. Mamayvamsa jiva loke jiva bhuta shanatana manashashtanandriyani prakriti shtani karashati that the soul is part and parcel of God. Najayate mriyate vakadachin. It is not subject to birth, not subject to death. It is eternal, primeval, not slain when the body is slain. Nahanyate hanya mane saride. Dehino smenyata dehe komaram yogaram chara. A sober person understands this principle that the soul is eternal. It is unchanging in any situation. Although the cosmic phenomena is always in a state of transformation, nothing is stable. The soul is passing from childhood to youth to old age. And at the time of death, the soul just changes into another body according to its inclinations, its desires, and its activities. Actually, prakriti, or material nature, is eternal. However, all manifestations of material nature are constantly changing. At every moment, yesterday Balavanta Prabhu was explaining different references of time, which are just inconceivable to us. What was it? The, the, the amount of time that a sun ray crosses over an atomic particle. Yes? 
Prabhupada also gives the example of nimesh, which is the amount of time when you when you unknowingly blink your eye, the amount of time your lower eyelid and upper eyelid touch. That's called a nimesh. And that's a long time compared to Balavanta Prabhu's analysis. <laughs> every nimesh, every moment, everything is changing, material existence. Due to our inability through our sense perception to perceive the finer details of how creation is working. We cannot understand that. But factually, everything's in movement. The neutrons and the protons and the electrons and the atoms and the molecules, everything's moving. Everything's in the process of transformation. There's really no such thing as death in the sense that anything ceases to exist. Everything's just changing. Your body was never alive. It's always dead. It's a corpse. That's all it is, even now. I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing you. (laughs) If you go up to someone and say, you look like a dead corpse. (laughs) Actually, you're just being factual. It is a fact. Everyone is a dead corpse. It's the soul that gives life to the body. The body's dead. Srila Prabhupada gives the example. A householder in his house. We have all seen that if nobody inhabits a building, it just crumbles. Because when you live in a building, you're always maintaining it. Yes. If somebody's living in a house for 50 years, it's in wonderful condition because they're always doing a little something. Maybe not all that much, but a little something. Cleaning something, maybe every year or two fixing something. But go to a house where nobody has been in there for 50 years. And it's just falling to pieces. Yes. So the body is like a house. And we're living within it. But actually the house, uh, when somebody's in it, you're you're using the toilets, if you have toilets in your house. (laughs) You're Vrindavan, we used to have to climb down a mountain and dig a hole in the ground. <laughs> but <clears throat> you're turning on the lights, you're using the faucets. So many things are happening in the house because there's a person. But when the person leaves, nothing. It's dead. When a person enters in an automobile, a car, you can turn on the lights, he can honk the horn, he can turn on the engine, he could turn right, he can go left, he can go backward, he can go forward. But when the driver leaves, what can the car do? It's just a dead matter. This body is just dead matter, like the house or the the car. Just different combinations give different textures and different appearances, but it's all just a combination of dead matter. So yes, we're just a corpse. It's the soul that sees through the eyes, smells through the nose, hears through the ears, touches through the skin, thinks through the brain, loves through the heart. But matter is constantly in the process of transformation. And because this transformation is all happening under the power of kala or time, it appears that everything is being destroyed. We look, because of our very minute relative perception of reality, we look at the sun and we think how this sun has been there for so many 
tens or hundreds of millions of years. Yes? Is, every, any, is anybody worried about that? We may be worried that Pakistan may, you know, shoot nuclear bombs on us. We may be worried about different diseases of malaria in mosquitoes when they bite us here in Bombay. We may be worried about when we're driving who's going to crash into us. So many worries. But is anybody worried about the sun burning out? Huh? <laughs> but factually, the sun is burning out. It's in the process. And in due source of time, it's going to just burn out. It's fizzle out, nothing. The greatest of the Himalayan mountains will become dust. And it's not going to become dust at a certain time. It's in the process now. Just as your body is aging, similarly, everything in material existence is being consumed by time. But that apparent consumption is not the end of the matter. It's just transformation. Srila Prabhupada gives example that this body that we're so proud of, that we want, to, we want to defend and give pleasure to at all risks, even at the risk of the, of the salvation of our soul. In due course of time, it will be one of three things, Prabhupada says. It will either be ashes, dust, or stool. Hare Krishna. Depending on your tradition. For some traditions, like most Hindus, they burn the body when it's dead. It becomes ashes swept in a river. For others, some of the Western religions, they bury the body. It becomes dust. Is it the uh, Parsis or the Zoroastrians? They, they, Prabhupada explains that they put the body on a mountain to be eaten by birds. This is the auspicious way. And what, what do the birds do? They eat you. Vultures. They just pick you apart and just... I used to watch how vultures eat dead corpses because I'm kind of in the mode of ignorance. I, it's really gruesome what they do. It's really gruesome. They eat you from the inside out. They go right through the rear side of your anus and they grab your entrails and they <coughs> just tug it out and they rip open your body by doing that. And then once you're ripped open, they go from the inside out. It's more succulent. <laughs> from their perspective. But then after they digest it, what happens to your body? That your soul, your soul, you're looking in the mirror to make sure it looks so nice. <laughs> you're putting perfume on your body and essential oils to be fragrant. But in due course of time, if you're of that religion, the vulture's going to eat you, and you're going, your body is going to become vulture stool. It's laying on the road, vulture stool. Somebody says, oh, that's my girlfriend. <laughs> That's, that's, the, that's the body I was so infatuated with. Factually, that's all it is. It's just relative. We see it at a particular stage, and it looks nice, and at another stage, it's, it's abominable. But the soul is eternal. And Srila Prabhupada explains that is the beginning of transcendental knowledge. That is where Bhagavad Gita begins. 
Who am I? What is my relationship with this material world and what is my relationship with God? And how my activities are influencing my destiny and how everything is under the control of time within this world except the soul. That is the five subjects of Bhagavad Gita. In this particular passage, we find how <clears throat> Hiranyakashipu is a scholar, as a scholar on this subject. In these pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, he is describing through scientific analysis, through profound, succinct logic and philosophy, through analogy, so perfectly the distinction between the soul and the body. Probably better than any of us. Yes? We're giving classes, but our words are not in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Hiranyakashipus are. Theoretically, he knows what is the soul. The particular setting of this verse, Hiranyaksha has just been killed by Varaha, Lord Vishnu. Diti, his mother, is brokenhearted. Oh, my little child. He was so sweet. He may have been naughty at times, but he's my child. Yes? And the wives of Hiranyaksha. <clears throat> They're all lamenting because of their attachment to him. Here in Hiranyakashipu is speaking to pacify them. He's more or less speaking what Krishna tells Arjuna in the Gita. <clears throat> that the wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Never was there a time when you did not exist, nor me, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us ever cease to be. Why are you lamenting? For first principle of Gita, the very beginning, we should not lament over death. Because the soul's eternal. And matter is always dead anyway. <clears throat> so Hiranyakashipu is very, very elegantly describing these principles. Why are you lamenting? Hiranyaka, Hiranyaksha, he's not that body. The body has to die anyway, it's inevitable. He's the eternal soul, the soul lives forever. It's part of God. He's speaking all these things with conviction. And by the power of his words, which is really amazing, he actually pacifies and gives enlightenment to his relatives. However, what is his realization? He has the theory so well memorized. And he understands it. And he can debate it. He can convince others of it. But it's all in his mind. It's all in his brain. None of this philosophy has touched his heart. How do we know? <clears throat> Hiranyakashipu is about to perform severe austerities for a long time. And Lord Brahma is obliged as a demigod. He has to come down and provide the boons that Hiranyakashipu asks for. <clears throat> That's the problem with being a demigod.
just like in many countries, there's policies of non-discrimination. Yeah? Somebody comes to your neighborhood and wants to buy your house, you can't say, well, you're a Muslim or you're a Hindu or you're a Jew or you're black or you're red or you're Lalo, so I'm not going to sell to you. I'm only going to sell to the person I want to sell to. You put your house for market. If anybody comes with the amount of money, you have to do it. Yes? You can't discriminate. You go into a store and somebody's of a different color or different religion, you have to sell. That's a law in many places. So the demigods are under those laws. Brahma, he's such a great Vaishnav. He's the father of, he's the secondary father of all living beings. Tene Brahma Ridaya Adakavye Muyanti Yatsuraya. Before anyone was born in this universe, there was Brahma who performed tapasya and Vishnu spoke, enlightened him in all transcendental knowledge from within the heart. He's the original guru of the universe. He's the guru of our sampradaya. He came as Takur Haridas, as the Namacharya. That's Brahma. But in his role as a demigod, he has to give whoever performs, the, whoever pays the price of certain yagya, puja, tapasya, he has to give what they want. Shiva, same way. In the Krishna book, we read about Rikashura. Rikashura is a demon. And Shiva, he is Vaishnavanam Yatha Shambhu. He's the greatest of all Vaishnavas. He has a whole, he's just like Brahma. Shiva has the Rudra Sampradaya. Vishnu Swami, a great saint, Balabhacharya, they are part of the Rudra Sampradaya. Teaching pure, unmotivated love for Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. That's what he's all about. But in his role as a demigod, Burkasur is cutting off his flesh and putting it in the flames, and then he's about to cut off his head and put it in the flames. And Shiva has to come. All right, what do you want? Give me the boon that whoever's head I touch will crack into thousands of pieces. Now, previous to this, we read in Srimad Bhagavatam about Lord Shiva drinking the entire ocean an ocean of poison just to show compassion to the innocent people. That's how compassionate he is. But yet as a demigod, he has to give a benediction to a demon who's going to terrorize the the innocent people. Because he paid the price. He said, all right. And then Bhagasura goes to touch Shiva's head because he wants to enjoy with Parvati. And Shiva has to, he's honorable. He has to honor the benediction. He said, whoever, that didn't exclude him. (laughs) So what did Shiva do? He ran away. Quite humiliating. He's running away from his own devotee. And the person's chasing, 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 and ultimately Krishna saved him. He appeared as a little boy and said to Vrikasura, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to touch Shiva's head. Then I'm going to get Parvati. I've been around, I've been watching. Shiva's blessings, they don't work. (laughs) For one who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. You're going to touch his head. Nothing's going to happen. Everyone's going to laugh at you. That's going to be worse than death. Better you test out this benediction and touch your own head. But he said it in such, such enticing manner that Brikasura didn't even think about it. He touched his head. And it worked. (laughs) Very nice. So, Hiranyakashipu is doing severe austerities. He was determined. Not only was he philosophical, not only was he logical and scientific about his understanding of reality, but he was determined. He stood on his tiptoes with his arms raised, 
practically not even breathing, drinking, or eating. Ants ate his whole body away. They made a hill around him. He kept his life sustained within his bones. And his tapasi was so severe, flames were pouring out of his head and scorching even the people of the higher planets. They approached Brahma, please do something about this man. He said, yes. He came down, sprinkled water, made his, made his body nice again. He said, all right, Brahma. said, what benediction do you want? Now, please listen carefully. I know you're sleepy today. <laughs> People get sleepy whenever I speak. It's, they <clears throat> Just prior to this incident, Hiranyakashipu is speaking these incredible words of, of, of enlightenment. That the soul is eternal, the body is temporary, don't worry about this body. So Brahma asks, what do you want? Hiranyakashipu says, make me immortal. I want to be immortal. What not? What a nonsense fool. The soul already is immortal, and you are the soul. That's what you already taught your relatives. <laughs> you already taught your relatives that the body is just material elements, you know, earth, water, fire, ether, and all that stuff, and it's going to die anyway, and it's not important. The soul is eternal. So why? He wants his body to be immortal. And Brahma, he says, I can't give you that, because... No bodies are immortal in this material world. Even I'm, even my body. Brahma lives 311 trillion years. Now, do you think that's a lot? It's nothing. <laughs> 311 trillion years. For, for Vishnu, it's not even a nimesh. It's not even a blinking of his eyelid. Relative to us, it appears a long time. Yes? If an ant lives for a month, everyone's thinking, ah, a month? He's like Lord Brahma of the ants. How could anyone live that long? But for us, a month? It's nothing. A baby dies after one month, and we, we go so unfortunate, hardly lived. So everything is so relevant. Relative. Everything is so relative to our own perception of reality. So Brahma says, even I have to die. This body. I cannot give you something I don't have. But Hiranyakashipu was so attached to his body, he longed for immortality of the flesh. So he asked for these benedictions. Let it be that I will not be killed by any rakshasha or any dayata or any dainya or any uh, <clears throat> or any yavana. I will not be killed by in, in day or night, in land or water or sky, by any of the species created by you, Brahma. Huh? Amazing. He's trying to cleverly, and after he got all those benedictions, he came to the conclusion, I am immortal. What a hypocrite. And he's preaching all this stuff. And he's telling them that you should not, you should not be aggrieved by the death of a body. That means to be fearless. But his own little son, Prahlad, because his son would not surrender to him. Hiranyakashipu, if you read the pages of the Bhagavatam, if you gave that particular second section to a psychiatrist, he's having serious psychological problems. <laughs> I don't know all the names, the clinical names, but he was just, he was going crazy. 
He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He was just walking around. And if, he, if I don't destroy him, then ultimately he will destroy me. He's the Lord of the universe. And a five-year-old son who's offering obeisances to him and who loves him. He's so afraid. That's how much Hiranyakashipu was totally attached to his physical body. Because however much knowledge we may have or not have, we always have free will in every situation. The spirit soul is part of Krishna. In every situation, we have our free will. And how we use our free will is how we're going to condition our perception and how we're going to create our own destiny. Even people who are in the exact same situation with the same facilities, the spirit soul still could make such diverse decisions. In Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita, it is described that Sri Adoita Charya, he had six sons. Now, Adoita Charya, he was such a compassionate person. When he saw how people were atheistic, when people were Mayavadis, he grieved for their souls. For years he performed tapasya, crying to Lord Krishna to descend to the world to deliver them. And it was by those calls that Lord Chaitanya appeared. Advaita Charya raised all his children in the same house in Shantipur, gave them all the same Mahaprasad that he was offering to Madan Gopal deity of his taught them all the same pure devotional service. Three of his sons became great Paramhamsas. Achutananda, Krishna Mishra, Gopal. Great Paramhamsas, pure devotees of the Lord. And three of his sons became Mayavadis. Now how do you figure that? Now, you're a parent, and you, lot, you think you can control your, your children. Well, Adoita Charya has to, happens to be Mahavishnu. <laughs> <laughs> All he has to do is just go, <laughs> just one inhalation, and the entire cosmic manifestation is finished. Yes, and all he has to do is go, <laughs> And the entire manifestation of all the universes are manifested. And he wants a family, just one glance. How long does a glance take? Just a second, one glance. And he impregnates Mother Nature with unlimited jivatmas. That's Mahavishnu. But even Mahavishnu does not interfere with the independence or the free will of a living being. So he gave the same facilities to all six children. Three became great pure devotees of the Lord. And three became Mayavadis. Useless. Now let's skip over to Hiranyakashipu's next life. He becomes Ravana the son of Vishrava and Kaikashi. And he had two brothers and a sister. Nice family of four. <laughs> Kumbhakarna, Suparnaka, Devi, and, <laughs> and Vibhishan. Now, they're from the same mother and from the same father. Hmm? Same nice little family of four. But let us see how they, how they all have their own independent free will. 
all four of them went to Gokarna to perform tapasya. And what tapasyas they did. They were all united in their tapasya because they wanted benedictions from Lord Brahma for their own purposes. It's like in those days, it was the way to prepare yourself for your future occupation, is you do tapasya. It's like today, the tapasya is you go to university. And you get your credibilities and you prepare yourself for the future. And if you don't want to go to university, your parents say, well, what are you going to do in the future? What will you be? You will be nothing. You have to prepare yourself. Well, this is the way King Prachini Barhisha told his sons. If you're going to be kings, go and perform tapasya. Gain good character, self-control. Connect yourself to God. Then you will be able to do everything properly. So they're all in the same place, Gokarna, performing similar tapasyas from the same mother and the same father. Now, Vishrava is the son of Pulasya Muni. Vishrava is a great saint. Pulasya Muni is a very, very great saint. Shall I tell you some of the tapasyas? Kumbhakarna. He did tapasya for 10,000 years. All of them, same amount of time, 10,000 years. During the summer season, he stood without shade under the sun and had four blazing fires around him. And he stood there the entire summer. During the rainy season, he kneeled down on one leg and just allowed the rains and the thunder to just soak him and drench him, not even eating or sleeping, just standing in the rain. And in the winter season, he went into a river underwater. He went into water and just stood throughout the entire winter for 10,000 years. Serious. As far as Vibhishan, Vibhishan also did 10,000 years of tapasya. The first 5,000 years he stood on one leg. Hare Krishna. Just meditating on the Vedas. The second 5,000 years he stood on his tiptoes with his arms raised looking directly at the sun and worshipping the sun. Ravana, he was really serious about this 10,000 (laughs) years. He did not eat, he did not sleep. He just stood. 10,000 years. At the end of the first 1,000 years, he cut off one of his 10 heads and threw it in a fire. At the end of the second thousand years, he cut off his second head, threw it in the fire. At the end of 9,000 years, nine of his heads were gone, only one remaining. At the end of his 10,000 years, he was about to cut off his tenth and last surviving head. At that point, Brahma came and said, enough, enough. You paid your price. What do all of you want? There's three of them. Same mother, same father, born in the same place, performing tapasya for the exact same amount of time, 10,000 years, in Gokarna. Ravana, what do you think he asked for? He said to Brahma, make me immortal. Didn't he learn his lesson as Hiranyakashipu? (laughs) He knows the philosophy, but he wants his body to be immortal. And the same old thing. Brahma said, I can't. He said, then give me the benediction that no dieta, 
that no Suparna, that no Rakshasha, that no Devata, no Demigod, not, no one could kill me. But don't insult me by giving any benediction that human beings can't kill me. Because they're just like straw in the street for me. Don't, don't, don't embarrass me. Don't belittle me by giving that benediction. So puffed up. That's why Ram appeared as a human being. So, Brahma gave him that benediction. And he also gave him the benediction that you could change your form in any way you like. And however many times your heads or arms get cut off, they'll grow back. So many nice benedictions. He also gave him tremendous amount of mystic powers. And then it came time, Brahma turned to Kumbhakarna, said, what do you want? At that time, the demigods appeared for some secret meeting. (laughs) Sometimes... You know, things get done in secret meetings <laughs> behind closed doors. <laughs> so, so the demigods approached Brahma and said, you know, step aside for a second, Brahmaji. You know, we have to talk to you before, <laughs> before you go through with this. He said, this kum, they said, this Kumbhakarna, he's unbelievable. He's gigantic. He's devouring everything. He has such a big mouth and he's so powerful and he's so huge. He's just devouring everybody, demigods, apsaras, gandharvas. He just just puts them in his mouth and chews them to death. He can't eat enough blood and flesh without any benedictions. He's going to destroy the whole universe. What's going to happen if you give him benedictions? So Brahma thought about it. He said, all right, I'll take care of this. Brahma called for Saraswati, the goddess of speech. And he said that when I ask Kumbhakarna what benediction he wants, Saraswati, you should control his speech. She said, yes. (laughs) So then Brahma came back to Kumbhakarna. And Brahma says, oh, best of the powerful, mighty, armed ones, what benediction would you like? And from Kumbhaparna's mouth, he said, give me the benediction that I will sleep continuously. (laughs) (laughs) And Brahma immediately, without hesitation, he said, so be it, and then left. He got out of there, right? He said, so be it, and out. He just, you know, zoom, you know, the, his, uh, his, his swan carrier just got right out of there. <laughs> and then Saraswati left. And as soon as Saraswati left his tongue, Kumbhakarna. <laughs> Why did I say that? I didn't want to say that. He had all his plans of, he had a whole wish list of benedictions and he has to go to sleep. (laughs) So then he fell asleep. But just before Kumbhakarna, Brahma approached Vibhishan. What benediction do you like? Vibhishan said, give me the blessing if, O noble Brahma, O son of my beloved Lord Vishnu, that even in the most difficult trials and tribulations of life, I will never for any reason give up virtue and dharma. And let from my mind no thought ever arise that will not please my Lord that will not be born in dharma and compassion for others. And let all of my acts 
be ethical, moral, and pleasing to God. Because I know one who follows such a path of dharma attains everything that is real and meaningful. Brahma said, I grant you all these benedictions. And Brahma, uh, he said, Brahma said, Vibhishan, you are immortal. He said, you are immortal. That means even his body, because it is acting on the platform of devotional service, even his body is immortal, in essence. A great soul has said that their body is spiritual. It may appear, it may appear to, to get old and get diseased and die like any other body. But that's only a relative perception. The fact is everything is potentially eternal and spiritual because everything is connected to God. And through devotional service, we can spiritualize everything. Yesterday and day before, my very beloved and revered God brother Balavanta Prabhu was discussing the teachings of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. How to spiritualize material nature by connecting it to the eternal Lord through bhakti or devotional service. Srila Prabhupada spoke through a microphone. He said, This microphone is spiritual. When I'm speaking about Krishna or singing about Krishna through this microphone, it is potentially material or spiritual depending on how we use it. Our body is potentially spiritual or material, depending on how we use it. So we all have free will. And this is the essence and basis of life. How we choose to use our free will moment after moment after moment. The reason we take vows at the time of initiation is it helps us especially to become serious and determined. This is what I want, but we'll only achieve it not by making a decision. We will achieve it according to how at every moment we make decisions. But when we're Drita Vrata, when we have a determined vow, when we have a determined conviction, and that determination will help us determine the choices we make at every moment. So very important. Because we have seen materially on every level and spiritually, even you know, just one second of inattentiveness could create havoc that may last for a long, long time. Human life is meant for responsibility. Therefore, nasta prayeshya bhadreshu nityam bhagavati sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktira bhavati naishtaki That is why we hear from Srimad Bhagavatam every day. That is why Prabhupada said, if a devotee is not chanting at least 16 rounds attentively every day, at any moment that devotee will fall under the clutches of Maya. That is a purport of his divine grace. So we're chanting every day. We're hearing Srimad Bhagavatam every day. Why? To, imp- to, to access the power of God to clarify our our intelligence, to, to fortify our conviction, and to access the grace of God to protect us, to empower us. Otherwise, maya is very, very powerful. Daivi he shuguna mayi mama maya durateya. Mame vami papadyante maya meita terantite. 
This material nature consisting of three modes of, are very, very powerful. Impossible to overcome for the jiva. Only one who takes shelter of me, Krishna says, can, can, can overcome it. The aversions, the temptations, very strong, and they come at any minute. When we're least expecting, they may come upon us. But if we're sincere to take shelter of the Lord, the Lord will protect us. But this is how we take shelter of the Lord. By regularly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, by reading Srila Prabhupada's books, by sincerely, regularly chanting the holy names, by keeping good association as much as possible. Through this process, we're expressing to Krishna that I'm taking shelter of you, my Lord. We do this in the morning, this morning program, our sadhana, so that through the day we will have the conviction and the inner spiritual strength to make the right decisions, to choose what pleases Krishna rather than Maya. We all have this free will. And it's not just about theoretical knowledge. Theoretical knowledge is is like a foundation. But you have to build something on that foundation through your actions. Jnana Vigyana. Krishna says there's, there's theoretical knowledge and realized knowledge. When we put theoretical knowledge into practice, it is realized. Then it enters the heart. So we see Hiranyakashipu represents the demonic nature within all of us. And even though he is such a great scholar of Vedanta, why is he a demon? Because he doesn't apply these teachings to himself. He's still thinking in terms of I, me, and mine after convincing everybody else that they're not the body, there's no one who's more attached to the body than him. Hare Krishna. Because without the grace of God, there can be no realization. A humble service attitude pleases Krishna. Through a humble service attitude, we can realize this knowledge. Some devotees ask Prabhupada, should we learn Sanskrit profound, profusely? Of course, for Prajumana and others, he encouraged them to learn Sanskrit. That was their, that was their um, inclination. They had that capacity And Prabhupada kept them, you know, doing humble service in their pursuit of Sanskrit. Prabhupada said, that's not what Krishna consciousness is about. That's just a particular service. He said, it's not about being a great scholar. It's about having the right service attitude. If you know just a few things of the philosophy but you please Krishna, those few things will be realized and take you back home, back to Godhead. If you know so many things, but you don't have that proper service attitude, you won't realize anything. And like Hiranyakashipu, you'll just be contradicting what you speak. So this is a very, very important subject. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also, their great emphasis was on devotional service. 
Yes, they wanted us to learn these books. They wanted us to, 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 to imbibe and to be able to, to, to defend the principles of Gaudiya Vaishnav Siddhanta through argument, through debate, according to our capacity. He wanted us to do that. Prabhupada said a devotee should be like a lawyer who knows the book so well he could refer to different passages to defeat any argument. But unless we have that humble service attitude, it all remains theoretical. That's really the basis. That Brahman in Sri Rangam, he was illiterate. And the greatest scholars in the whole planet were living in Sri Rangam. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not look in the direction of those other scholars. He sat with that illiterate Brahmin who was, who was, he was reciting the verses of Gita. He didn't know if it was right or wrong. The other scholars knew it was wrong. Lord Chaitanya asked him why. He said, my Guru Maharaj ordered me to read the Gita every day here. Everyone's laughing at me, ridiculing me, chastising me, because I don't, I'm, I'm illiterate practically, but I'm trying. I'm trying to please my guru. I'm his humble servant. He didn't understand the words, technically. Lord Chaitanya said, well, if you don't understand the words, then, you know, what is your understanding? He said, as I'm reading the Gita, I'm just seeing Krishna, who has a beautiful bluish form, who's taking the reins as the servant of Arjuna. Such a, such a Lord, serving his devotee and speaking the truth. He, Lord Chaitanya said, you have realized the essence of Gita. You are the true authority of Bhagavad Gita. He embraced him, gave him love of God, and for the whole four months, every day, the Lord would spend time with that Brahman. Because of his service attitude. He knew everything that was required to be known. So Hiranyakashipu, he is here. He's quoting Yamaraj. Mahajano yena gatasapanta. Yes, Yamaraj is a Mahajan. The path of perfection is to follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. He's citing the great souls. Here, Hiranyakashipu is quoting one of the greatest devotees in all of existence, Vidura. But what is his realization? Envy, lust, greed, pride, and fear of death. Hare Krishna. Because he is not using his free will properly. He knows what Vishnu wants, but he's unwilling to utilize his free will for that purpose. So we all have our divine and, divine and demoniac natures that is discussed in Bhagavad Gita. It is very important that we strengthen ourselves with knowledge as far as possible, with association, with the grace of God, so that we can use our free will for Krishna, for Srila Prabhupada, for the Vaishnavas. Thank you very much. It's very late, so we will end here. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.